Hello, I'm Jamie Harrison, Chair of the Democratic National Committee. Thank you, President Johnson, NAACP board members, membership, and convention attendees for allowing me to speak today. It's an honor to address the convention, and I'm looking forward to the day when we can all gather together safely. My friends, in spite of all of the turmoil and pain of 2020, when I look back on the past year, I'm still filled with hope. When faced with a global health crisis, an unstable economy, and a social justice reckoning that was a long time coming, the Black community did not back down. When faced with friends and family who were hit harder than others over the past year, we did not back down. When faced with cynicism and despair, we did not back down. We stood up and we spoke out in the most effective way possible. We voted. In 2020, Americans cast more votes than in any other election in our nation's history. And the Black community was a major part of that. Voters, many inspired by the people here today, turned out in record numbers and made it clear that it was time for change. And over the past few months, the Biden-Harris administration and Democrats in Congress immediately got to work delivering relief. They showed us what real leadership looks like in a time of tragedy. They also reminded us why elections matter. My friends, at the center of America's very essence is the right of the people to choose who represents them. Black Americans know as well as anyone why this right is so precious. Because for so many years, people have been working to take it from us. My grandfather, who helped raise me, used to tell me stories about the efforts to suppress the vote in South Carolina. No matter how hard he tried, he was up against a system built to keep him from voting. He and I used to always vote together. Voting turned out to be one of the last things we did before he passed away. After going to the polls that last time, we sat on the porch. And he looked at me and he said, never let anyone tell you that you don't matter. Never let anyone tell you that you don't count. My friends, those words are as important now as they have ever been. There are people around the country who are still trying to keep us from voting. They don't want us to count. We're already seeing it in a number of states. They're making absentee voting harder. They are adding technicalities that could disqualify legitimate votes. They've turned voting into a partisan issue. Voting rights shouldn't be a partisan issue. It shouldn't be an issue at all. It should just be. One person, one vote. Voting is the great equalizer. Our vote gives the factory worker the same say in power as the billionaire CEO. Our vote is precious earned with the blood, sweat, and lives of our ancestors. And as such, it must be guarded and protected. And everyone needs to remember that the thing about voting is that it just doesn't happen once. And it definitely happens more than every four years. You might live in a community that has local or statewide elections this year, and the congressional elections will take place again in 2022. We need all of you who turned out in 2020 to keep coming back. We need you to keep making your voices heard. We need you to hold our leaders accountable. We need you to organize. That's how you build and maintain political power. Stay engaged within your community. Listen and learn about the needs of your neighbors. Then take a look at the track record of the people running for office. Who is delivering for you? Who is just trying to gain power to serve their own interests? In my home state of South Carolina, our motto is, while I breathe, I hope. But that can just as easily be, while I breathe, I vote. Because with every vote, we bring hope back to our own lives. With every vote, we bring hope back to our families. With every vote, we bring hope back to our communities. With every vote, we bring hope back to this great nation. That ballot is our hope for a better future.
As President Obama said, there's no such thing as a vote that doesn't matter. My friends, there isn't going to be a superhero flying in to save the day. If we want American democracy to thrive, we, all of us, we must fight so that every vote matters. We must fight so that every person matters. We must fight so that our grandchildren aren't enduring the hardships suffered by our grandparents. Frankly, my friends, we will not go back. We will not go back to the days of Jim Crow. My kids and your kids will not live under a system where their voices and their votes do not matter. We all have an active role to play in defending our democracy. And I know, I know this to the core of who I am, that I can count on the NAACP to do what it has always done, doing the work on the front lines to guarantee that everyone's voice is heard. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the convention. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome NAAC board member and current president of the Honolulu, Hawaii NAACP branch, Afonso Braggs. Good evening, everyone. We are excited that you are joining us today as we hold a critical discussion on voting rights, redistricting, and elections. And I want to thank all the members of our very distinguished panel who've graciously given of their time this afternoon to help us navigate tonight's discussion. Let me highlight a few of the points that we're going to cover. We're going to talk about equal access to the ballot box. And I want to make it real clear that our unconditional position is that everyone must have equal access to the ballot box and that access must be protected. We want to remind America again that elections have consequences and some of our elected officials are hard at work trying to limit, suppress, and steal the vote away from black and brown communities. Take note, we will fight to improve voting rights and mobilize our voters. We're gonna talk a little bit about federal voting rights legislation. And we'll begin with Congress, and thank you Congresswoman for being with us tonight. Congress must restore the Voting Rights Act by passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, HR number four, to help protect voters from racial discrimination and voting voter suppression. We also call on the president, his administration and Congress. They must continue to improve on the minimum standards that passed in several states due to COVID-19 pandemic in several key areas of election administration to ensure full and safe voter participation. Now what this means is offering a variety of measures to make sure that voting is accessible during any public health crisis, including automatic and same day. Automatic voter registration for individuals turning 18 years of age and even making election day a federal holiday. Fighting state-based legislation that seeks to confuse voters or in any way restrict them from participating or disqualifying voters based on actions of a suppressive nature. Finally, we're gonna talk about priorities in our black community going into 2022. And there's a list of priorities that matter to our community, several things. This list is not all inclusive, but I wanna just lift up a couple of those, a few of them. Economics, health, education, climate, criminal justice reform, voting rights, elections, and racial equity across the board. With that, let me invite you to sit back, enjoy, as well, and make a commitment to join us in this fight. 
Again, welcome, and again, thank you to our very distinguished panel that we have this evening, and I'll now turn the program over to Ms. Watkins. Please join me in welcoming the 55th Mayor of the City of Boston, Mayor Kim Janey. Good evening. My name is Kim Janey, and yes, I am the 55th Mayor of the City of Boston. Uh, and as the 55th Mayor, I am working very hard to overcome Boston's reputation as being a city that has not been always welcoming or inclusive. Uh, but I know that I can't do that alone. As we heard earlier from one of the speakers, uh, we can't do this work alone. There is no savior who is going to come and save us. We together are going to do the work. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And so I am just grateful to be here to offer a few words on this very important topic. I think it is important that we ground ourselves uh, in the history. And we know the history when it comes to voting rights uh, in our founding documents. Uh, we were not included in that as a people. Voting was reserved for white men with property, left out women, left out poor white men, and certainly left out black people. We have come a long way, but only because of the work that we have done together. We do this work together because we know voting is essential uh, to our democracy. And in fact, black people in general, and black women in particular, have been saving this country one election at a time. We saw that with the rise and election of President Barack Obama. We certainly have seen that. Uh, in our vice president and in this administration, the Biden administration. But we've seen that all across our states. Uh, certainly the work and organizing work, I want to be very clear, uh, that people have done in all of our states. We have Georgia as an example and able to tip the scales in terms of the United States Senate because of the organizing work that was done there in the work of Stacey Abrams. And so, I want to take a moment uh, to just uh, acknowledge and thank the panel. I'm sure this is going to be a rich discussion. We know why uh, voting suppression, uh, voter suppression is real. Um, we see a rise in Black women uh, running for office in historic numbers and winning their races. As I sit as the first Black mayor of Boston, and the first woman mayor of our city, we see black women all over our country leading major cities in our country. We know why folks are trying to keep us from voting. We have to continue to do the work and do this work together. So I wanna thank this panel uh, for bringing folks together to have these important discussions and making sure that we are armed with the information and the tools to continue to do this work. I also want to recognize uh, some of the folks locally as someone who spent much of my career uh, in community organizing. I'm a founding board member for Mass Vote that does a lot of this work on the ground here in Massachusetts and in Boston. I also want to acknowledge uh, Michael Curry, who is the uh, immediate past president of the Boston branch of the NAACP and serves on the national board, uh, as well as our president, Tanisha Sullivan, uh, for their amazing work and leadership in the city of Boston and for their partnership. Uh, this issue is real for all of us. We've got to continue to do the work and we always have to remember that they thought, they tried to bury us, but they did not know we were seeds. Thank you everyone and have a blessed and productive convention. Good evening, I'm Carmen Watkins, Senior Vice President of Field Operations and Membership. And I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening. With well over a decade of experience in politics and over 15 years in public speaking, your moderator for tonight has made a name for herself as a respected, intelligent voice in modern politics. 
She is a highly sought after political strategist, public speaker, political analyst, and social justice activist. She's been a regularly featured commentator on MSNBC and NY1's Inside City Hall, and she has had several key political positions. She currently serves as the president of the Brooklyn NAACP and is also the legislative coordinator for the New York NAACP State Conference. L. Joy Williams is chairman emeritus of Higher Heights for America and now serves as the chair for Higher Heights Political Action Committee. In this role, she travels the country, training, advising, and supporting efforts to build Black women's political power and leadership potential. El Joy can be heard every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. on Sirius XM Urban View. Her show, hashtag Sunday Civics, teaches civics using the current political landscape. And you can get it on demand at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Radio Public, and all podcast platforms. Guys, please join me in welcoming El Joy Williams. Thank you so very much, Carmen, and thanks to all of you who are tuning in for this wonderful conversation. And thank you in advance to our panelists that we're going to hear from shortly. We're going to have a very in-depth but quick conversation about voting rights, redistricting, and elections that we all have to stay on guard for. I know for a fact that NAACP branches across the country are continuing to do the work to ensure that we continue to increase our numbers at the ballot box while also continuing to effectuate change um, in between election day. So with that, I want to get right to our panelists. I'm going to introduce each of them. Um, and after I introduce all of them, they will then take two minutes to talk a bit about uh, the issues at hand. But I want to let you know if you are watching, if you are tuning in for us, you can also put questions uh, in the chat. We have someone who is pulling questions. And as we get to the Q&A portion, hopefully I'll be able to get to your questions at that time, but feel free throughout the conversation um, to put your question in there as well. So I'm going to go first to introduce the lovely Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, who is a native Ohioan with a strong history of connecting people, policy, and politics to make a difference. I'm partial to her because I'm named after a Joyce. And so since 2013, she has proudly represented Ohio's third congressional district. She's the current chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, the largest CBC in history. And she currently serves on two exclusive House uh, committees, uh, the Committee on Financial Services, and she's also the member of two subcommittees, those on housing and insurance and oversight and investigations. She is very active in addition to representing her constituents. She is active in the links. She's uh, active in Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, the Columbus Urban League, the American Heart Association, where she previously served on the board and numerous other organizations. Congresswoman, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Well, first of all, let me just say good evening and thank you for that very gracious introduction. And certainly to you, Mr. Whitehead, thank you for all that you do and all of the leadership, uh, all of my good friends at the NAACP uh, for your work and for hosting this 112th virtual national conference. And to all of the other panelists that are, are on this, it speaks volumes, not only for the NAACP, but also for the leadership we have in this country. Let me just take my minute and a half left to say, I am honored to serve as chair of the powerful Congressional Black Caucus. We are celebrating our 50th anniversary, where we continue to work and fight every day as the conscience of the Congress. I also want to say we have been in the forefront and we will continue to fight. Think about it, Shirley Chisholm, John Lewis, individuals who not only served in Congress, but Shirley Chisholm, one of the 13 founders. John Lewis, who marched across that Edmund Pettus Bridge for us to have the right to vote. 
How proud will we reflect on our history of August the 6th, 1965? Well, let me just tell you, the Congressional Black Caucus understands what we have to lose, what Black Americans have to lose. We understand that if you can't change the future, you can't change the future if you don't acknowledge the past. And that's where we are, fighting for voting rights, we know how many times it was rewritten over the years, but here we are still today fighting for HR4. It is at the forefront. It has gone through our House Administration Voting Rights Committee with the Honorable G.K. Butterfield, having more than a half dozen hearings. We know what happened in the Supreme Court with Section 2. We know what's happened with preclearance. But here's what I can tell you. The Congressional Black Caucus is out front, and I assure you that we are going to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. I can tell you it is at the top of our list. I can tell you that it will go through the Judiciary Committee, and we will be working with the Senate. And certainly we know that President Biden cannot build back better without the Congressional Black Caucus. We know the Congressional Black Caucus cannot use our power, our message, without the NAACP and all of the other civil rights organizations. We are joining in partnership. And let me say, Dominic, let it be announced tonight that the CBC stands with our Texas brothers and sisters in the legislature. We have stood with them. Many of them are in Washington, and we will stand with them. Let me just tell you, the women, and I'm so glad that, Madam Mayor, you talked about women in our leadership. I can tell you on the 14th and 15th of this month, civil rights Black women will be marching on the Senate side. We will be in the middle of the streets, and yes, as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, I will be joining them. And it is all about stopping suppressing our vote. And lastly, let me just say, if we don't fight for this, if we don't stand up for our right to vote when people were hosed and died for that right to vote, then we should not be talking about what can we do. We can stand up and fight. And I can tell you why. That's the only thing that has made a difference in our history, when we have come together and fought for justice, fought for freedom. And we've done it in recent years. We saw what happened with the Affordable Care Act when we were in the minority in the House and Senate. Seventy plus times my colleagues tried to change and do away with it. Pre-existing conditions, keeping young people on their parents, insurance. But what did we do? We took to the streets. We marched. We got arrested. And now we still have health care, housing, education. It has all been sustained and maintained when we come together and stand and fight for justice. We've been doing Black Lives Matters for decades. Let's join with our young folks. Let's go old school and new school. And I can't tell you, I could never be prouder than to stand with the NAACP as we pass HR4, as we pass HR1, as we talk about HR40 with reparations. These are all interconnected, interlinked, and latched and locked in our fight. And I am so honored to be here and share more on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus. And so everybody watching, I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and I approve this message. Well, thank you, Congresswoman. See, there's a reason why we need to, I, Joyce brings this fire. I feel like Joyce all across the world, you know, bring this fire <laughs> um, and joy to uh, our organizing and advocacy space. Um, I want to bring next up to uh, introduce to you our, our next panelist, the Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, who serves as Wisconsin's 45th Lieutenant Governor. He's the first African American to serve in this position and the second African American elected to statewide office. He currently serves as the chair of the governor's task force on climate change, as well as the Health Equity Council, the Governor's Council on Financial Literacy, 
uh, literacy and capability, the criminal justice coordinating council. I don't think there is a governor's council that the lieutenant governor does not serve on um, at this point. And so I want to uh, welcome to give his uh, opening remarks as well uh, for two minutes, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. Oh, wow. I think we are like literally back just in time. I'm in a church right now. I have this um, laptop sitting on a lectern and not sure if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah. Go on. Good. All right. Well, um, I just want to say thank you all for having me. I uh, really glad to be able to participate in this discussion as uh, state of Wisconsin we continue to deal with multiple uh, voter suppression efforts and I'll say that uh, unlike or like many other after the election in 2010 many states like Wisconsin moved to make it more difficult for people to vote and in states that aren't necessarily diverse we know where those uh, those voter ID laws we know who they were targeted at uh, but I want to say, though, in, in response to it, the response has been incredible. It's been magnificent, both in terms of elected officials who fought back, but also in terms of the voters who fought back, who beat the odds. And I uh, think about last year in, the, uh, when the, in, in April when we were the only state that did not delay our spring election. And it was not for lack of trying. The governor stepped up and said, let's move this thing to June when we can get a hold of the virus and at least uh, know what we're dealing with. And the majority party in the legislature denied that request. And people went out and they put themselves at risk. Poll workers put themselves at risk as well. And we also had some weather events that made it more difficult uh, for people to get out there and exercise their rights. But the fact is, people still showed up. But the reality is, they shouldn't have had to in the first place. And so protecting our voting rights remains essential. And we know that more than a century after the right to vote was declared fundamental, we see that right still under attack constantly. And there are efforts that make it harder for our minority groups all across this country to participate in the political process. And we see this proliferating all across the country. We are in a person It's important to outline what's going on, but it's also important to outline and talk about our efforts, our role in combating these suppress suppressive efforts. And so I think about uh, the current administration, the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration, and Congress, and influencing and promoting uh, policies to protect voting rights. There's still so much more uh, that we can do. We need the Senate Act. We know that it was 18 lives for years of intimidation and murders, but also after advocacy that led and put us on the path to the voting booth. And it became clear for black people with Federal Voting Rights Act of 19, uh, 1965, law protects every single American's right to register to vote and cast their ballot and also remains one of the hardest fall safeguards uh, for our community and for other minority groups as well. And I think about uh, decisions the Supreme Court has made and the constant attacks, whether it's Arizona or whether it's Texas. Uh, a lot of my friends decided to flee the Capitol, and I, I, I commend them for their bravery in the face of such odds. Uh, but the fact is, if we don't start fighting for courts as much as we fight for presidential elections, we'll be in a world of trouble uh, because ultimately these decisions are going to be decided. Uh, by a judge somewhere and someplace. And if we don't start doing the hard work now to reform the judiciary, uh, we can see ourselves in a world of trouble. We can see a generation of people with their right to vote uh, being impeded on. And that's absolutely um, a fight that we should be willing to put up. We should be ready and willing to get engaged in that struggle as if it were 1965 all over again. Thank you so very much, uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, for that context. Next, I want to go to our next panelist, Ashanti Golar, who is currently the president of Emerge, the only organization dedicated to recruiting and training Democratic women to run for office. And prior to that, she worked at the DNC, at the Democratic National Committee, United Way Worldwide, and she was an appointee of the Obama, Obama administration and also worked at the convention 
She's one of the She the People's 20 women of color in politics who will play an impactful role going forward in our politics. She's also the founder of the Brown Girls Guide to Politics, which was named one of the top political podcasts by Time Magazine and Marie Claire. Ashanti, thank you so very much for making time. Oh, always. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Al Joy. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Ashanti Golar, and I'm honored to be the first Black woman who is the president of Emerge, where we focus on recruiting and training Democratic women to run for office. People ask all the time, why the focus on women? And it's really simple. We want to make sure that we don't just have an inclusive democracy, but that we have a reflective democracy. That's why Emerge's goals going forward focus on the new American majority, Black, Brown, and Indigenous women, women of color, young women, unmarried women, and LGBTQ women. We know that in 2020, these were the individuals who not only delivered us victories across the country, but they were also some of the most exciting candidates on the ballot. When we look at our country in elected office, there's 520,000 elected seats in this country. Men occupy about 75% of those seats. Women's of color representation is not where it should be. Black women's representation is not where it should be. And that is where we focus on at Emerge at all levels of office because we know specifically the leadership of Black women is needed. We have over a thousand of our alums serving in elected office, and that includes many notable firsts, such as the Black woman, the first Black woman mayor of San Francisco. We have many of our alums who have been the Black woman elected to their seats in state legislatures, and also several Black women emerging alums on the Boston City Council. We also have many alums who serve as Secretary of State. We have alums who fight every day to protect voting rights because they know it is extremely important. So when we need to talk about protecting the right to vote, securing the right to vote, and emerge, we know that who you have in elected office is key to making sure that those liberties are protected. Thank you so very much, Ashanti. And lastly, but certainly not least, um, the person responsible um, for ensuring that branches all across the country are engaged in our campaigns uh, from the national office down to the branch level. Dominic Whitehead serves as the vice president of campaigns for NAACP. And prior to that, he was a political action representative for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, where he he oversaw electoral programs and campaigns in Florida, Michigan, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. He graduated from Bethune-Cookman University, where he received his BA in International Studies. And again, Dominic, thank you so much for gathering us all together for this conversation. Thank you so much, El Joy, um, for the introduction. First and foremost, evening. NAACP partners, supporters, and friends, thank you all for participating and joining in this important conversation um, that we're going to have with this amazing panel uh, this evening. Uh, I think everyone said in their remarks from Chairman Braggs to the Congresswoman, President Golar, and the Lieutenant Governor, um, voting rights is at stake. Um, what we did in 2020, what we did in November, what we did um, for the Georgia runoff election in January, where we elected a Jewish man and an African-American man from Georgia to the U.S. Senate because of the work of Stacey Abram and so many other groups on the ground. They are directly coming for us and trying to continue to suppress our vote. So this evening, um, I'm excited to be a part of this conversation, to dive in, to kind of think through what we can do big picture, what you can do right at home um, in your area, what you can do and tell Congress to act on and what they can do in terms of passing voting rights, but tie that into redistricting, which is extremely important, um, as well as of elections that we have this year in 2021 and in 2022. So I'll stop there. Um, we have a full conversation that we want to get into. So I will kick this back over to El Joy, but good evening again to everyone. Thank you so very much. And the questions are already starting to come in. And just a reminder, you can put your questions in the chat. You can do so as we're having the conversation. I already see things are populating. And don't worry, I'm going to make sure to uh, get all of the questions in, even if I have to consolidate them so that we can continue the conversation. But Congresswoman, I want to go back to you for a moment, because earlier today, President 
Biden gave a speech uh, in Philadelphia using the words of the late Congressman John Lewis and urging for the passage of the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And you talked about in your opening remarks the commitment that the CBC and some others have in ensuring that happens, but we are certainly at an impasse. And so I want to ask from your perspective, what uh, what more can the current administration and Congress do to ensuring that we see a uh, passage of these two very important pieces of legislation on the federal level? Well, I, I think it, it's, I think it's very, let me see if, it, am, am I, okay, I thought I was muted, I'm sorry. I think it's very important for us all to continue to speak up and speak out. I think he did a great job today in, you know, bringing the dialogue to the forefront. This is something that we have to do. But I think it's going to take all of us. I think it's important for us as leaders, whether it is the members of the House or the Senate, standing up for voting rights. But it's also going to take the people of America standing up and fighting and speaking out. All of the work that Jamie talked about that we're doing with the DNC, we continuously to rightly so sing praise to Stacey Abrams. But just think if we all doubled down on what you're doing with the NAACP, what everybody on this panel is saying. So another reason tonight is so important and for everyone that's sending the questions in, it's important for us to answer the questions ourselves and to say, not what are you all gonna do as the leaders, but let me tell you what we are going to do collectively because that's what Martin Luther King Jr. did and John Lewis and Fannie Lou Hamer, all of different generations, all of different thought patterns. Keep in mind, Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis didn't start out as companions and colleagues. It was the young John Lewis taking on Martin Luther King, not agreeing with him turning back at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And that's why I think, as Alfonso said, history is so important for us to know. So I, I think we have to keep in the forefront. We have to march. You know, and marching is not new with people holding our fists up and saying black lives. I remember when we said, I'm black and I'm proud. I remember when we put our fists up to get arrested. I think we have to do social media. I think we have to do what we're doing today live. But I think we have to be out there in the streets and knocking on doors and letting America see if we can't have the right to vote, we should not be revisiting August the 6th, 1965. We're getting ready to be at August the 6th, 2021. So I think in Congress, we have to go to the House floor. We have to build back the confidence in our constituents that we're not afraid to fight, that we're not afraid to get arrested, that we're going to stand up for something. And lastly, Eljoy, we have to make the folks who weren't here during the 60s or the 70s or even the 80s understand that they are in the positions that they are in now because somebody died. Somebody gave up something hoping that the future could be better. So my, my last thing that I've said to the president, and I have the honor two days from now going to San Diego where we will have the christening of the John Lewis battleship. And, and, and we're making history every day on what he did, but we have to continue to be in this fight together. So you will see us doing special order hours, the Congressional Black Caucus. You will see us doing press conferences with our own congressional delegation. Uh, we have members who serve in Congress that have been out in the forefront in Texas with those individuals. We issued a statement. So I'm gonna ask you to push the Congressional Black Caucus because we're out there. We have an amazing Congressional Black Caucus staff team. So we are sending out uh, social media, but we are also holding the president and everyone accountable. We write letters. He's our president. We support him. I believe he's gonna build back better, but we have to help him. We have gotcha. to continue to be in this fight. 
You know, Ashanti, to the Congresswoman's point about the other actions that we can do, I saw a conversation on social media uh, earlier today um, where advocates were reminding folks that even to get to the voting rights bill of 65, that it was more than just uh, legislative actions that were uh, that were taken in order to get to that point, in order to get to the passage of the Voting Rights Act at that time. Um, so, talk a bit about, from your perspective, you know, what other organizations and folks uh, can do. Some alternate folks, and Dominic, feel free to jump in as well from an NAACP perspective. How we can continue this drumbeat and doing uh, the pressure necessary to uh, use an Obama, a uh, President Obama phrase to make the administration do this. We have to use our voices. It's really that simple. That is how we have been able to get to this point. And everyone who is on this panel, everyone who is watching, we have voices. We have networks. You have to utilize them. There are people that will listen to you. There are people that respect you, that they see you as an expert being involved. Post the information. Pick up the phone and call. Tweet it out. Host your own Zoom gatherings. We know that misinformation is running rampant, especially in this age of social media. So we have to make sure that we are actively combating that. And that starts with us as regular individual people. So use your platform and think of any way possible where you can ensure that the proper information is getting out. And another thing that I'm going to say that I say all the time is that they are expecting us just to be so tired and exhausted by all of this that we won't fight anymore, that we'll just give up, that we won't show up at the polls. And we have to make sure that we're pushing back on that as well because they want that disengagement. And that's how they want to continue to just do what they're doing in Texas, do what they're doing in Georgia. We have to make sure that we are front and center with the fact that we, as regular people who put these people in office, are paying attention and support the good work that is coming out of the administration, that's coming out of Congress, that is coming out of state houses, to know that that is the information that is getting to people. Well, Dominic, um, you know, Ashanti said it <laughs> wonderfully, um, but I, I do want to, and Congresswoman, feel free to jump in on this question. We do have questions um, from the chat, um, uh, Amelia Kramer and uh, 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 Susan Kelly are asking about the filibuster and whether or not there is some limited at least action that can be done as it pertains to the filibuster regarding voting rights. And just before we go on to talk a bit about redistricting, because I don't want to miss that important part um, of what is our responsibility over the next uh, couple of years, but is there more that can be done regarding the filibuster from the current administration or, or not in order to pass uh, these two pieces of legislation really quickly oh. El George, oh, sorry no, go ahead. Go ahead. really quickly I'll, I'll jump on to what Ashanti was saying and hand that over to the congresswoman in terms of, of, of the filibuster uh, but just to add to what Ashanti said she, she hit the nail on the head I will only add the energy that we saw in 2018 post 2016 the energy that we saw in 2018, the energy that we saw in 2020, the energy that we saw at the beginning of this year for the Georgia runoff, we have to continue to use that same energy in terms of organizing and mobilizing, particularly around policy advocacy. Um, so a lot of times we went to the voting booth in November, we went to the voting booth again um, in, in, in January, but need folks to now go back and hold our elected officials accountable, particularly in this very moment right now, calling your U.S. senators, calling your congressional members, and continue to advocate and say we need passage of H.R. 1, we need passage of H.R. 4, most importantly also telling your stories as well around voting and, and issues that you may or may not have had um, in terms of voting. And the last piece I would just add to that, we have any ACP units across the country, right? Uh, country branches across the country engage with your local NEACP unit unit or branches and other organizations work in coalition coalition and collaboration together to build on the ground program directly because you make impact at the state level and the local level as well as much as you can at the federal level so I would just add that uh, to the piece of the Shanti added but I'll take it over to the congresswoman um, around the filibuster piece 
Well, let me just say thank you for that question because I think what we do and how we resolve this also includes the American people. We know just today that Vice President Harris talked about a carve out for voting rights uh, with the filibuster. We know Congressman James Clyburn has been talking a, a lot about the filibuster. I can tell you the Congressional Black Caucus does not believe that you should be able to do the threat of a filibuster to hold up the voting rights legislation. And that's what's happening. If you want a filibuster, go on record and say why you don't want to have HR4 passed. But I think one of the things that's very creative that we are supporting is what has been presented by Majority Whip James Clyburn and today, just a few hours ago, with Vice President Harris, working with the senators to be able to say, could we do a carve out to pass the voting rights um, bill to make it not fall with under the filibuster. That may be the best way of getting people on record. Because keep in mind, you have to go back to your districts and you have to go back and explain why you don't want hardworking American people, taxpayers, our young folks to not have the same rights. Why you want to deprive us or have voter suppression or shorten the days we can vote or make us jump over the same hurdles that we had to do like counting jelly beans in a jar 50 years ago by now putting those restrictions in. So I think we, we know how we feel about the filibuster. You cannot filibuster away my civil rights. So we should not be supportive of allowing members in the Senate to just give the threat of they're going to filibuster and there we are requiring the number of votes. So I think we have some good propositions to, to bring it to a closure and we're going to be far, fighting hard at least to help us get through HR 4 without the filibuster. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Now, Ashanti, I have a question in the chat from Carolyn Coleman um, asking about how do we uh, position ourselves in politics to be proactive rather than consistently reactive. And, you know, I, I've posted about this most recently is like just once I want to be on the the proactive side and want people to be fighting back against me rather than the other way around and I feel that way as it pertains to redistricting coming up it, you know in this cycle and as someone like yourself who not only on the federal level but also on the state level are identifying um, people to run in places like a Texas or others where we see the demographics changing but the legislate the state legislature Legislature, which controls the redistricting process hasn't yet changed. What are you uh, visioning forward in the redistricting process that we should uh, have on the front of our minds? Oh, you're on mute. I mean, I knew I was going to do that at least once. <laughs> so I really love this question because something that I say all the time at Emerge is I want to be playing offense and not defense. And we have had a strategy around state legislatures because of redistricting. We just didn't start to pay attention to redistricting in 2016 or 2018. Emerge, the national organization, started in 2005, and we've been playing the long game. If you look at Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, and Oregon, all of those states have majority women state legislatures, and that's due to Emerge alums. And those are all women who are about protecting the right to vote. So that is the key thing to know that redistricting is always going to happen. So every cycle, you have to be paying attention to who is running for these seats. What do they stand for and get the good people elected? Because you can't be trying to do all this work four years out ahead of redistricting thinking that you're going to make major change. If we look at state legislatures across the country, Republicans are very close to having the two thirds that they need necessary control, two thirds control to call a constitutional convention. And that absolutely terrifies me because we know what will happen if they're able to do that. So that's something that should always keep people wanting to be proactive. What happens if these people are able to fully change 
everything about our country and is very simple when it comes to redistricting. When done wrong, it is another form of voter suppression, pure and simple. And that is what they will want to do with redistricting this go round. Use it as another form of voter suppression. So pay attention to what the process is going to look like. Because in many states, they're debating it now. But pay attention to who all the key players are. When I say we focus on all levels of office, one of the levels of office we focus on is auditor. Because in some states, the auditor actually plays a role in redistricting. So it can be all of these people. So that's how you are proactive when it comes to redistricting, is to know that this is a consistent process that is going to happen all the time. And every year, you have to be fighting to get the best people in office who have a say, who oversee the redistricting process. Well, you know, I know that um, the lieutenant governor has to go shortly, and so I wanted to give him an opportunity to also make comments about this because, as we know, redistricting, you know, begins in a state process, and I, you know, I, I don't look it, but I've been through many of redistricting cycles where, in places like Texas, Wisconsin, and others, um, it has been difficult to ensure uh, people's rights um, going forward. So, lieutenant governor, I just wanted to give you a moment. Um, to talk in advance about the redistricting process on a state level, perhaps in Wisconsin. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just forgive me for, the, for my video quality one more time. I, I just feel like I need to say it again. Uh, I wish I could be, you know, being virtual, we're already so distant. And the fact that I can't have my video on right now makes me feel even more distant. Uh, but the fact is, uh, yeah, I was a former member of the legislature. And we all know the importance of redistricting, especially from a racial lens. And we acknowledge the importance of doing just that. Uh, but the fact is, here in Wisconsin, uh, as Republicans have control redistricting, this is going to be the second straight cycle. This time, the governor has the veto pen. And not to make this uh, too political, it's just the facts. Uh, when redistricting took place in 2011, so 10 years ago, um, it was one of the most extreme gerrymanders in the, in the country. Now, that's a dubious distinction that a lot of states fight for. Uh, but the fact is, uh, I would like to say that Wisconsin is particularly egregious. Uh, the courts declared, the, uh, de declared our maps unconstitutional. Our case went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court kicked it back down to the lower court, effectively just kicking the can down the road uh, so that the next, uh, next set of maps will be drawn by the time a real decision needed to be made. Uh, currently, uh, the maps that we're using now are still in limbo and there are other games too that they're using and while we're talking about the um redistricting i, I want to thank the naacp for their work when it came to the census because the census numbers obviously determine what uh, legislative districts and uh, census tracts are going to look like uh, to draw those boundaries and it was important for us to get uh, as a complete count or as close to it as possible. And as we know, there have been historically undercounted communities that include communities of color, that include students, that include lower income individuals. And when this happens, uh, we see uh, we see disproportionate uh, representation because of gerrymandering. But another thing on top of all that too, is prison gerrymandering. Because we got people who are, you know, assigned to a, a legislative district, not based on their home, but it's based on uh, where they're incarcerated. And that's, uh, that's one of the other unfortunate things that, you know, we need to talk about as well, because that's a system that also needs to be fixed, because it contributes to racial inequality. It contributes to unfair district boundaries uh, being drawn. Uh, here, given the fact that the governor, uh, you know, the executive branch doesn't draw the maps. Legislative branch draws the maps. The governor has the option to veto or not. But our governor came up with the uh, People's Maps Commission, which is going to be uh, an independent, which is an independent commission, uh, made up with representatives from all eight congressional districts in the state, and they will be tasked with holding public hearings. They've already held most of them, if not all of them, and also going to they will participate in an independent map drawing process. Now. People have asked, well, what does this mean? Is it legally binding? The answer is no, but we expect a court fight. And it's important that 
we're ready when that time comes. So when the maps are drawn by the legislature after the governor vetoes them, because there is no way we should expect them to do the right thing and draw fair uh, district boundaries, um, when that happens and the governor vetoes them and that happens uh, a second time, we will end up seeing this battle go to court. And if we are, we do find ourselves in court, it would be much easier to present as evidence what a fair map looks like, what a truly representative map looks like, what an open uh, and fair process also looks like. And my last point too, I'll just go back to the census before I wrap, is that, you know, the census was, you know, we had a, a bunch of delays, a bunch of uh, time changes last year. And now that that data is gonna be a little bit late because of the pandemic, Republicans have been trying to use uh, the current district boundaries for the next election uh, for local offices. And trying to use that would give them everything they need to be able to use these same exact maps in the 2022 election. And I want people to be aware uh, if, you know, if that is going on in your state or if it's not, uh, please pay attention to that, to, to, to that, uh, to those bills that are popping up that would create uh, uh, more unfair uh, districts, more unfair elections as well. You know, this is actually another form of voter suppression because in Wisconsin, uh, Democrats in the popular vote receive well over 50 percent. And in the legislature, we have 38 percent of the seats in the lower house and about 37 percent of the seats in the state Senate. So it is a real problem and, a, and, a, and it is, uh, you know, I don't have to explain too much. People know about it, but the question is always, how can the public fight against this? And that's a hard one to answer. Uh, the only answer I have is to stay involved and stay engaged and uh, make sure that you participate in these processes. Well, thank you, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. And I know both yourself and uh, Congresswoman um, Beatty um, have to go on to your next items. And I want to thank you both so for very much for making the opportunity or taking the time um, and the opportunity to join NAACP. And I know that we uh, will continue to have your partnership in our ongoing fight um, for the rights of our people. So thank you very much to both of you um, for that. Um, just as we um, uh, uh, wrap up um, our conversation, we do have some additional uh, questions that I want to uh, combine here. And um, Dominic, a lot of them, because we have a lot of our branch presidents and NAACP leaders across the country um, who are tuning in and watching this, they are asking the question, that you always get as an NAACP staffer, where's their toolkit on voter suppression? Where are um, the things that they should be doing in their local communities, the resources that we can get from national in order to make this happen, to follow along the redistricting process, to ensure that uh, legislators in um, the state legislatures across uh, the country who we are tasked with monitoring and engaging with, that we hold the folks accountable, where are the tools? <laughs> all, all great questions. Uh, great questions. Uh, so first and foremost, can folks hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. So first and foremost, first and foremost um, I say uh, in terms uh, of the toolkit, we are launching in the process of launching um, a voting rights campaign um, in the next few days. Um, that campaign will consist of a toolkit. It will consist of activations across the country, um, directly in localities across the country, um, here in Washington, D.C., at our nation's capital as well. Um, and those two kits will consist of messaging, um, social media posts, um, you name it, in terms of an NEACP toolkit. Um, but most importantly, a part of our activations that we're going to be focusing in on, throughout the summer, we have been engaging in so many different uh, mobilization efforts digitally, whether it's been our textathons that we've been doing, I mean, getting folks to come on um, to actually text in real time, whether it's been our call-a-thons, we have been calling Congress um, and the U.S. Senate um, in terms of passing voting rights, um, if you will. We're going to begin a training series um, coming in the next few weeks around voting rights um, and redistricting as well. This is, a, this is an important conversation. We've already started um, a training series with redistricting with our legal team and general counsel office, um, thinking through mapping and what that looks like as well in key states 
um, that we're focusing in on redistricting. So our toolkits are coming, uh, but it's bigger than a toolkit, right? Uh, we can have those toolkits and we can have folks repost social media posts and we can have folks, um, you know, tweet out information, but we need folks to be active and mobilized and engaged. And so when we launched this voting rights campaign with a few other partners, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because there's a larger announcement coming um, in the coming days around voting rights and how we're engaging. We're going to need each and every one of you, all of our units across the country to dive in, get in, boots on the ground, and do what NAACP do, um, and quite honestly, raise holy hell about what is happening in this country today around voting rights. So we are, we hear you. I appreciate that question so much, L. Joy, around what is the ask, the call to action, and to do. I would say in this moment, at this very time, we are continuing to ask all of our units to engage with the general public, engage with your community, educate folks on what's happening, and we'll have those talking points and messaging um, around with that, and tell people to call Congress, call their U.S. Senators. I would actually say call your governor of your state or put pressure on your governor to tell your governor to put pressure on the U.S. Senators and congressional members in your state. This is that important. So much more to come um, in the coming days around um, our tools that we will be using um, in the field for all of our members and partners um, to engage in this fight. Thank you so very much, Dominic. And Ashanti, I want you to address in these final moments that we have uh, for this conversation, um, I believe it was Sonia White and uh, Reggie Weber Jr. who also commented in the chat just to collapse this question together about people, and I think you mentioned this earlier, about uh, black folks and voters who literally have given up. Um, and sort of the apathy that is planned, right? Like the, the onslaught um, of issues to fight on every, in, in every turn, um, people are counting on uh, apathy setting in, that the system is too big, that is too many things to do at one time. They don't see an entry point. Um, they don't see how they can make a difference, certainly, uh, as NAACPers, we don't have, you know, we, we, we don't suffer from that uh, for a long time. But, um, you know, I want to give you a moment to talk about that very real uh, feeling of feeling like it's too much, that it's too big um, of a giant to take down. What are your thoughts? One of the things that I always say when it comes to this work, just politics in general, governing, we have to be honest about the fact that this country, when it comes to voting, to political participation, this system was built for land-owning white men. It was not built for us. So the fact that we are participating, that we have the ability to participate as women, as Black people, as people of color, they never planned on this at all. So we are disrupting a system. We are challenging power structures, and that scares a lot of people. So that's why they do everything to just try to make it harder, to try to make it more difficult, so that we're just like, you know what? Doesn't matter. Nothing that has been passed has really impacted my life. I'm not seeing any of these bills make things better for me. Just, I'm not going to participate. And I see that all the time, too, when it comes to recruiting women to run for office. They'll just say, I, I don't have the right background. What can I do? And I encourage them and say, you can do a lot because we need people with our background, with our lived experiences doing this work. Because if we're not out there talking about it, if we're not out there raising these issues, if we're not having those seats at the table, Nothing changes at all. But we have to be real that that apathy is very, very real in our communities. And we have to be the ones to let them know, okay, this is what happens when you get involved, when you can get the right people in office. We saw what the pandemic was like in 2019. And I'm sorry, 2020. And now we're seeing what it's like in 2021 with different leaders at all levels of government. So we have to show them real change can happen when you have the right people in there. And we are the best messengers to do that. 
Well, thank you so very much, Ashanti. And I did as much as I could to consolidate our questions that were coming in the chat. Hopefully I got to as many as we possibly could as we end this hour. I wanna thank our panelists for joining us for this conversation. Uh, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, Ashanti Golar, and well, as well as Dominic Whitehead from the NAACP. And I wanna kick it to him now um, as we close out this conversation this hour. And thank Thank you so very much for being with us. Uh, thank you so much, L. Joy, uh, to our, all of our panelists, Ashanti, for hanging in there with us, uh, to the Lieutenant Governor, the Congresswoman, um, as well as the Mayor, Chairman Braggs. Uh, thank you all for being a part of this important conversation. This is only a start. Um, we know that we have to do the work each and every day. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we are launching off something big um, coming very soon around voting rights. So again, thank you everyone for being a part of this important conversation. Um, continue to go out um, and continue to fight. Uh, this work is important and we have to do it together. We cannot do it by ourselves. Um, this is work that is a collective body of work um, and setting in solidarity with each other. So again, thank you everyone for joining um, this panel discussion this evening.